Well, good morning. The Lord be with you. Welcome. Thank you for joining us this morning. Uh, good to see you. Uh, I've been saying to people, you may have heard me say, um, I think I'm preferring sep- September to November at this point with the way the weather's been, but um, it's, it's strange that uh, it's cool and wet, but... Uh, but it's good to be able to gather it anyway. Uh, we, uh, we come together this morning to, uh, to share together, to uh, join together in the Lord's Supper, to sing God's praises uh, and to hear from him as he speaks to us from his word. And we're going to do that now together. We're going to uh, join in uh, declaring God's praises. We're going to do that with uh, Psalm 103. So if you'll join me in this, let's join together in this. The Lord is compassionate and gracious, slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbour his anger forever. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. For as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Let me share these words with you. God calls us to live our lives to his glory. Jesus said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. This is the first and greatest commandment. The second is like it. Love your neighbour as yourself. All the law and the prophets hang on these two commandments. But we fail to honour him as we should and to respond to his love for us. Recognising our guilt and trusting in God's mercy and grace, let us therefore confess our sins together. And we do so with this prayer. So together. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have gone our own way, not loving you as we ought, nor loving our neighbour as ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, and in what we have failed to do. We deserve your condemnation. Father, forgive us, help us to love you and our neighbour, and to live for your honour and glory, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Merciful Father, We rejoice that you pardon and forgive those who truly repent and trust in your Son. Deliver us from all our sins, confirm and strengthen us in all goodness, and keep us in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We are going to join together in a great hymn that I think celebrates the grace that we have received from our God in the forgiveness of our sins, and we're going to simply join together in that great hymn of John Newton's Amazing Grace. That saved a wretch like me I once was lost But now I'm found Was blind But now I see T'was grace that taught my heart My fears relieved How precious did that grace appear The hour I first believed My chains are gone I've been set free My God, my Savior
to come to the reading of God's word. As we do, let me lead us in prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you for the Holy Scriptures, their precepts, promises, directions and light. In them may we learn of Christ, grasp his truth and have grace to follow in his steps. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So Peter's going to come now and uh, bring to us our first reading from Psalm 77. Psalm 77. The writer of this psalm finds himself in great distress. Its causes we do not know. But most of us have passed through the dark nights of the soul. But what the white writer soon realizes as he reads the scriptures he focuses in on all the ways that God has disclosed himself in power in the past. He remembers the Exodus. He thinks of the amazing deeds then, the crossing of the Red Sea. He remembers them all. And we Christians have more to remember. As we read the scriptures, we remember the incarnation the years of Jesus' life and ministry, and above all, his death and resurrection. And as we remember, our faith is strengthened, our vision of God is renewed, and the despair lifts. So I will read the psalm. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. 
When I was in distress, I sought the Lord. At night, I stretched out untiring hands, and my soul refused to be comforted. I remembered you, O God, and I groaned. I mused, and my spirit grew faint. You kept my eyes from closing. I was too troubled to speak. I thought about the former days, the years of long ago. I remembered my songs in the night. My heart mused and my spirit inquired. Will the Lord reject us forever? Will he never show his favour again? Has his unfailing love vanished forever? Has his promise failed for all time? Has God forgotten to be merciful? Has he in anger withheld his compassion? Then I thought, to this I will appeal. The years of the right hand of the Most High I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will meditate on all your works and consider all your mighty deeds. Your ways, O God, are holy. What God is so great as our God? You are the God who performs miracles. You displayed your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob and Joseph. The writers saw you, O God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. The clouds groaned and poured out down water. The skies resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Though your footprints were not seen, you led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. May God bless to us this reading from his word. And our second reading for this morning is from 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I must go on boasting, although there's nothing to be gained. I will go on to visions and revelations from the Lord. I know a man who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether it was in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man, whether in the body or apart from the body, I do not know, but God knows, was caught up to paradise. He heard inexpressible things, things that man is not permitted to tell. I will boast about a man like that, but I will not boast about myself, except about my weaknesses. Even if I should choose to boast, I would not be a fool, because I would be speaking the truth. But I refrain, so no one will think more of me than is warranted by what I do or say. To keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. 
Having heard God's word read, let us respond in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. He was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, universal and apostolic church, we acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. As we come to God's word, let me uh, lead us in prayer. Our loving Heavenly Father, we give thanks for you, for the God that you are, for your mercy, your grace, for the ways in which you reveal yourself and speak to us as we have just heard. Heavenly Father, we pray now that as we turn to your word, that Father, we will uh, be able to understand what you are saying and that we can respond in faith and obedience as your spirit empowers us. And we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. So today we are in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 10 in our series, Self-Esteem, Seeing Ourselves as God Sees Us. And we are today are reflecting on how in Christ we are weak yet strong. And as you can see, the series list is getting quite crowded as we have traveled through uh, this program. Now, in this passage of 2 Corinthians 12, 1 to 10, Paul is opening up to us his personal life, even his private thoughts and feelings behind his preaching and out of which his preaching flowed. It's a passage full of deep emotion and personal revelation. It's a passage where Paul is revealing the core of his being to us, and he does so for our great benefit. So we must listen carefully to it, because as you will have felt, as you, we, we heard Murray read this passage, it's not easy, but it has great value for us. And here I want to say, I think, is what Paul is saying to us from this deep and revealing piece of scripture. He is saying, our greatest growth in faith will come through the worst experiences of our lives. Now, by way of context, in this section of, letter in, uh, of this letter in 2 Corinthians chapters uh, uh, 10 to, uh, to 13, Paul is defending his ministry. And essentially he feels embarrassed to do so, but he also feels trapped. Here's what's happening. Paul's ministry is under attack in Corinth by men he sarcastically labels as super apostles way back in chapter or back in chapter 11. These false teachers have infiltrated and are moving through the Corinthian church boasting of their spectacular spiritual experiences and they are also putting Paul down as inferior. And the immature Corinthians are dazzled and their growing attachment to these super apostles, it, it, Paul says in chapter 11, verses 3 and 4, puts them in danger of falling away from Jesus Christ himself. So Paul must rescue them, but with these 
false preachers carry on, he has been made the focal point of, the, of controversy in a deeply personal way. Uh, so he cannot help the Corinthians refocus on Jesus Christ without also becoming self-referential in his appeals. He's got to talk about himself. For, to bring them back to Christ. And he's in an awkward position. On the one hand, if he asserts his spiritual qualifications, his critics will point at him and say, see, what did we tell you? He is the arrogant one. On the other hand, if he downplays his credentials, then they'll point at him and say, see, what did we tell you? He's just so average. Either way, the Corinthians' spiritual integrity and life before Christ hangs at this moment on their relational stability with Paul. And he has no choice but to defend himself for their sake. But the way Paul uh, boasts is surprising. He, he, he boasts, certainly, all right, certainly he does, but he boasts about unboastable things. In he, this, he steps in onto the turf of these super apostles, but he plays the game by different rules. So we come then to chapter 12, where we find Paul boasting. And what he does is he, he, he reclaims bragging rights in the hearts of the Corinthians by revealing the kind of mind boggling spiritual experience his opponents were spruiking, but he turns the tables on them. You see, God indeed did give Paul a guided tour of heaven. But then for 14 years, Paul has said nothing about it. Evidently, he never wanted to seem above others by speaking of this remarkable experience. He had kept this incredible experience a secret. Yet now, when he is forced into divulging his sacred privilege and he feels so awkward that he, he, he backs into this in a third person way. Did you see this? He says, I know a man in Christ who. And according to verse six, Paul prefers to be known only for what people can see in him and what they can hear from him for themselves. He, 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 and he, he prefers to be seen as just a man, a man who trusts in Jesus, a Christian. Why? Because he knows how divine grace and power is actually gained. He knows it's not through privileged experiences as the super apostles are suggesting. It comes through common ordinariness and even suffering. Extravagant spiritual or mystical experiences are not Paul's platform for preaching faith and holiness. Everyday life is, and even hard life. Let's understand here, Paul isn't belittling his experience of the third heaven. God has given this to him. It was a great experience and a great privilege. But that high and holy moment was not where Paul found inspiration for his ministry. Rather, the, his driver and motivation in ministry actually happened in the worst experience of his life, receiving his thorn in the flesh and having to learn to live with it. Now, I have to say, whatever the thorn was, it was horrible, and we do not know what it was. Let, let's but just see, though, how Paul's metaphor draws us in. Imagine this, you're coming down from a mountaintop experience, walking a trail back down to the real world. Your heart is flooded with heavenly joys beyond all your powers of description when suddenly you stumble and fall and instinctively you put your hand out to catch yourself and you ram a thorn right into your hand. In one instant, your joy is driven away by piercing pain. You stop, examine your hand to see how to pull the thorn out, but it has penetrated too deeply. In fact, that thorn never comes out of your hand. It never stops throbbing, and it will never stop for the rest of your life. 
every day, whatever else you're doing or trying to do 24-7, whatever else you're thinking about or trying to think about moment by moment, the thorn is always cruelly there. That horrible reality is, is Paul's new normal. And, and I guess as we hear this and think about that, we could well ask, couldn't we? Why did this happen? Why would the Lord kneecap, so to speak, his most capable worker? Well, Paul explains the effect of the thorn that has been given to him on two levels simultaneously. At one level, it came out of hell's dirty tricks department. In verse 7, Paul calls it a messenger of Satan. The fact that Paul experienced it as a messenger from Satan might imply that his physical anguish was accompanied by fiery dark thoughts like, you know, coming from Satan. You have this coming to you, Paul. God is finally catching up with you. Your life is over. You really are worthless. You're a piece of trash. Satan meant it to harass Paul because the verb in verse 7, a messenger uh, of Satan to harass me, it's in the present tense, implying that it's got an ongoing, steady pounding of pain. But not only is this, uh, uh, this, uh, uh, this thorn a messenger from Satan, at the same time, at a deeper level, it's also a mercy from God. It seems that by it, the Lord meant it to keep Paul's feet on the ground, so to speak, after his vision of heaven. In fact, the gracious purpose of God wraps around the fiendish purpose of Satan as the phrase, to keep me from being conceited, appears both at the beginning and the end of verse 7. You see, God is the hidden agent here. And it's why Paul goes to the Lord for relief in verse 8 as he cries, Lord, I could do so much more for you without this. And so faced with this painful thorn, this terrible weakness. Understandably, Paul sees two, two options as he looks to his future. Firstly, he could go on living with this thorn and be, and, and be much less useful to Christ. Or secondly, if he could get rid of the thorn, he would be far more useful to Christ. Now, we can see in our position, he does not yet see a third option, and that is to keep the thorn Add in God's all-sufficient grace and become in weakness more empowered than ever before. See, before realising this third option, Paul goes to the Lord three times to make his case because this thorn is not just inconvenient, it is unbearable. It is intolerable. Now, we frequently see in the Gospels, as we read them, that people come to Jesus for healing and he gives it to them. So Paul asks the same Lord for healing, not once, not twice, but on three occasions of earnest, pleading prayer. And what happens? Well, each time the Lord gives the same answer, verse 9. My grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. Now, undoubtedly, that is not the answer that Paul wanted to hear. But what this divine response does is it opens Paul's heart to more grace and strength from beyond himself. You see, what the Lord teaches us all is, is that in this life, weakness is the... And I want us to hear the definite article, the fundamental human experience. Weakness is the platform on which we have all other experiences. We never grow beyond weakness in this life. Indeed, weakness is where we receive grace and strength. The theologian Karl Planck, uh, he's a pretty straight fella. Um, sorry, that's all I have. He says this, he says, the study of virtually any aspect of Paul's theology 
must eventually consider this language of affliction, not because of its abundance as much as its fundamental character, deeply enmeshed in the fabric of his gospel and his way of seeing the world. The language of affliction does not simply provide another theological topic in the Pauline compendium. Rather, it exposes the very ground on which the apostle does theology. It's the very ground upon which Paul uh, places his ministry. I mean, weakness is the basis of Paul's ministry. And you've got to ask, just think on this, what leader... What ruler, what CEO, what monarch conducts themselves with a slogan like this? My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. The Lord is saying to Paul, I'm never going to pull that thorn out of your hand or wherever it is, as long as you live. But my grace, my friendship, my nearness, my promises, my presence, my truth, my smile, all that I am will match all you are suffering. Your pain and the weakness it reduces you to will be the very avenue through which I bestow my power. If your experience of life were undisturbed, if you were always at ease, if you felt no temptation to despair of yourself, you would trust yourself. And you would exalt yourself and thereby disempower yourself. And your wonderful experience of heaven would become your ruin. Paul, my power will become yours most perfectly in the humbling experience of weakness. So as a result, Paul saw weakness not as part of the evidence the super apostles used against him to mock him, but rather as the way of grace and power and the wonderful surprises that only God can orchestrate. And I have to say, weakness is the Lord's way for all of us. You see, clearly, the super apostles knew nothing of weakness and suffering. All they understood was the importance of being impressive, and they were. But of course, that kind of fraudulent and ungodly power and showmanship threatened the very integrity and the very future of the Corinthian church. You see, authentic, real Christianity does not produce a race of superheroes who rise above need. Rather, the most perfect expression of authentic Christianity in any age is divine grace and power received with the empty hands of human weakness and poverty and pain. I mean, just, just reflect, if you will, on the way God works in the world and how his power has been exerted. You think about that. What has he done? His greatest work is found in a complete act of impotence, shame, failure and suffering. Christ's death through the torturous and humiliating root of crucifixion is viewed by Paul's world with the Gentiles as completely shameful and even unspeakable. And for the Jews, Christ's cross was the ultimate in disgrace and damning divine curse. But as Paul began his correspondence to this church way back in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, he declared openly that, the, that Christ's cross is so un unimpressive, it is considered as foolishness to the world. He says in verses 27 and 28 of chapter 1, God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things. You see, the Lord deliberately uses weakness, shame, pain and suffering to do his work. You see, it's Christ's cross that sets the precedent for Paul's thorn. And applying this to ourselves, we've got to ask, without a thorn, would we even open our hand to God? 
And so we, 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 after this third appeal to the Lord, Paul finally accepts his thorn and this thing, this thing that makes him weak. In fact, he more than accepts it. He likes it. He is happy with this new arrangement. Verse 9, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly of my weaknesses so that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Paul doesn't conceal his weaknesses because he's not threatened by them. In verse 9, he says that through his weaknesses, Christ's power may rest on him. And that verb, episcana, translated rest upon, appears nowhere else in biblical Greek. Paul here is using a word which basically means tenting or tabernacling because he wants to draw us uh, to us the picture of the Shekinah glory of God hovering over God's people in their wilderness wanderings. The Bible says in Exodus 40 verse 35 that Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud of God's glory had settled on it. But incredibly, in, this, in the new covenant, following Christ's work, here Paul says that the afflicted Christian believer now becomes the place where God's glory dwells. Now, obviously, Paul is no masochist. He does not necessarily like, enjoy or seek pain. I don't think any of us are. But he knows that the power and presence and glory of Christ are more than worth the suffering. So Paul, importantly, is not feeling sorry for himself. And I think we need to hear this. He is not feeling sorry for himself. Rather, he feels privileged. How can the world defeat a man who finds power in weakness, progress in setbacks and opportunity in imprisonment? You see, if God in his grace and plans has a purpose for you, and he does, beyond all you can ask or think, you do not need to go looking for your thorn. It will come to you. It will find you. When you are truly in Christ, something will enter your life, something unforeseeable, even unthinkable, something about which right now you would say, no, that can never happen, not in my worst nightmare. And then it will happen. I have to say, I think this, if we're truly in Christ, this will be inevitable for us. You see, when this thorn of pain and weakness comes, that's when God will prove to you how wonderfully, even surprisingly, his grace and power can rest upon you. Can you believe it? And I think this hardship, this pain, this weakness, it is what the world needs to see in us. It's what we each need to see in each other in the church. Not the weakness of power, but the power of weakness. When, when, when people are looking for spirituality today, do they know where God has actually located it? Our world is looking for comfort and ease and strength and capability and power. And I think we Australians, we people in New South Wales, we people in the Illawarra, we people in Shell Harbour need to think about that because I think it's often what we seek. Yet God does not work in the impressive or in the comfort or in the ease of life. He works in the weakness and the pain. One commentator wrote this, which I, and I don't know who it was, but I, I picked it up somewhere, but anyway, he said, in the, in the world and to the world, as we Christians trust in Christ, despite our weakness and suffering, we are living proof of gospel power when life is impossible. God will prove it to, through you. He will show many people through you that his power is enough for anyone facing anything. And not with bitter resignation, not with self-pity, but with reverent delight. When people see it, that is weakness and suffering in you. They will put their hope in God. Finally, in verse 10, Paul broadens the relevance of the grace of Christ beyond his own experience of the thorn to everything that we will ever face. 
That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. You see how Paul is making an inventory of problems we all experience with a a fill-in-the-blank kind of open-endedness? Weakness, insults, hardships, persecutions and calamities. I'm sure we could add to the list all of our woes, pains and failings too. And as we ponder all the difficulties, the Lord says to us today as well, my grace is sufficient for you. You feel inadequate, even overwhelmed, but don't worry about it. When you are defeated, I am victorious for you. When you are confused, I am clear-headed for you. When you are fearful, I am unstoppable for you. My glory will hover over you and my grace will follow through you. And all I ask is is that you give your weakness to me and I promise to give you my grace and my power. The great Charles Hodge, who's a theologian, comments, when really weak in ourselves and conscious of that weakness, we are in the state suited to the manifestation of the power of God. When emptied of ourselves, we are filled with God. So how do we get there? How do we live there? with weakness and suffering. I mean, how do we cope with weakness and suffering so that we know God's purposes are in it? I mean, everybody suffers, don't they? But how is our suffering to be different so that it is a witness and something that God can use? Well, I think the key phrase here is in verse 10, where Paul says, I do this for Christ's sake. We need to let those words be the death of our self-focus and the beginning of something new and deep and happy and resilient. It's when what happens to me for good but often for ill is no longer my primary concern in life, however natural or intuitive that is to me. It's when my motives for life change from for my own sake to for Christ's sake. The Apostle John in Revelation 14.4, describes this kind of faith as, it is these who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. There are no preconditions for this kind of mindset, and there is no holding back. It's all about being all out for Christ. And this is humbling, and this is hard, yes, but it sets our hearts free. I recently watched a video of the US Navy's uh, Blue Angels squadron. The Blue Angels are a squadron of fighter jets that fly in the most amazing aerial formations, often at, at, at air shows. You may have seen them on TV. And each of the pilots uh, on the Blue Angel team, they are top guns. They are the best of the best. They are the most skilled and capable pilots in the world. They have to be. But when the pilots review footage of an aerial performance and their team leader guides them through improvements, their standard reply is, just glad to be here, sir. Why? Because it's an incredible privilege to be on that team. And so it is with us as servants of the Lord Jesus Christ. Just glad to be here, sir. You see, there needs to come a time when we stop asking the Lord to take the problem away and we come to a deeper delight in his overruling power. There needs to come a time when we look at the death of our dreams and think, now I have the privilege of seeing what only Christ can do. It's when God gives us the gift of weakness and we are glad just to be involved with him him in any way at all. And we don't, we don't think like this easily, do we? We are likely to think badly of God if he doesn't take our pain away. Could we ever think that hardship is his means of growing us and making us what he needs us to be? It's not the way our world thinks. But as I look back on people in my life who have encouraged me in faith, and through whom I have learnt most about enduring genuine Christian faith, they are always people who have endured suffering in faith, not complaining, 
not making a big deal of it. They have just pushed on in their faith with joy and gratefulness and thankfulness to God for their salvation and for his blessings, whether they come easy or if they come hard. I finished this morning by sharing from the 19th century pastor and writer Andrew Murray, who in his book Humility applies this passage to our lives with really, I think, very reverent wisdom. He says this, he says, let us look at our lives in the light of Paul's experience and see whether we gladly glory in weakness, whether we take pleasure, as Paul did, in injuries, in necessities, in distresses. Yes, let us ask whether we have learned to regard a reproof, just or unjust, a reproach from a friend or enemy, an injury or trouble or difficulty into which others bring us, as above all, an opportunity of proving how Jesus is all to us, how our own pleasure or honour are nothing, and how humiliation is in very truth what we take pleasure in. It is indeed blessed, the deep happiness of heaven, to be so free from self that whatever is said of us or done to us is lost and swallowed up in the thought that Jesus is all. And I want to finish by saying, I think that is it. Living life in all its weakness and hardship with that great thought of Andrew Murray's and I would say the Apostle Paul's. And that is that Jesus is all. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the life and ministry of your servant Paul and the wonderful truths, hope and power found in his many letters. We pray that with your grace we would be kept from prideful thoughts and ungodly actions. Keep us low at the cross, Father, walking in humble obedience. And thank you, Father, that your grace is sufficient for us. Thank you that your strength is made perfect in our weakness. May our lives be living testimonies to your goodness, your power and your grace. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, we're going to uh, join in song now. Uh, we're going to uh, uh, sing the great old hymn, um, I Stand Amazed in the Presence.
Uh, well, we're shortly going to go to prayer that Peter's going to lead us in, but uh, just some things for your attention by way of notice. Um, next Sunday, we will be returning to the church building, which is good news. And uh, to attend, the same uh, sort of rules apply to us that we've had to um, observe here. Uh, we'll have to QR check in and give a wellbeing affirmation as well. Um, hand sanitise on entry and exit. And uh, we'll have two metre square seating, um, social distancing, and uh, singing is only for the, the double vaxxed. And uh, we need to continue to wear face masks at all time. Uh, if you're not feeling well, please uh, please just uh, refrain from coming. That would be appreciated. We're going to have to um, also uh, have the, the building open uh, for maximum ventilation. And we do also need to clean the building thoroughly after the service. So we're still uh, travelling on those, uh, those arrangements at this time. And uh, we will wait for any changes in uh, public health orders uh, as, as the government uh, lets us know those. Uh, secondly, also just to say, there's a couple of things that are, are, are happening and ca coming up. Uh, last Sunday was, of course, our term two, uh, term, term four, sorry, gift day, and uh, we were supporting CMS. Uh, CMS, uh, you can continue to uh, to assist us with that, um, and uh, there are envelopes on the back desk if you'd like to uh, to still make a donation. That would be appreciated. Uh, Toys and Tucker again, because of COVID, there's not a physical collection of gifts for f of food and and, pre and presents for kids. Uh, it's simply going to be a donation of, of, of money, of cash. So that's coming up again in, in early December for us. And next Saturday, uh, weather permitting, um, we will have a, a, a working bee um, here at the property. So if you can bring your tools and your protective clothing along, that would be great. Um, we commence around eight o'clock and you can be here, we'll be through here through to about 12. Um, if you can spare an hour or more, that would be great to help out. Um, just uh, just cleaning up the buildings and, and the and the uh, the grounds uh, much appreciated and if you can bring things like wheelbarrows and like things like water gurneys are helpful and and um, and just you know obviously we're we're clearing rubbish and, and filling the bin out there so that's what we'll be doing next Saturday morning um, also just to say and uh, a couple of other things to share with you briefly um, We have, you may have noticed, I mentioned last week now, a what's called an AED, a defibrillator, uh, in the uh, in the hall foyer just at, uh, near the toilet doors there. And uh, this device is designed to be uh, to to assist any person suffering a cardiac incident, uh, and can and it can be operated. I want to stress this: it can be operated by anyone. This uh, this uh, defibrillator. Um, please do use this defibrillator, this AED, if the need arises. I want to encourage everyone to, make, to avail themselves of this if it should ever come up that someone is having a cardiac incident. Uh, to operate the defibrillator, you simply press the green on button and the machine will speak instructions to you. It will tell you what to do. It's very simple. Uh, we, we hope it never needs to be used, but if it saves a life, we will be thankful and we are very grateful for this very kind donation. Uh, but it is there to be used if you need to. Obviously, we don't want it used unnecessarily. Uh, we don't want it to be, it's not a play thing. <laughs> I'm going to keep the kids away from it in that regard. But it, it's, it's, it's a, a helpful device potentially for saving someone's life. So it's there, it's available for anyone to use. Uh, obviously, if there's a, a trained person around, in, 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 uh, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a, a first aider if, for, what, for what it's worth. Uh, we obviously have someone like uh, Ian McCorkindale, who's a doctor. Uh, obviously, they would take the lead in a, in a, in a, um, a health uh, crisis, but um, it is available for anyone should, should you need to use that. Also want to mention, um, Fig Tree Anglican Church, they have a new rector, and uh, this, uh, we must rejoice in this. It's the Reverend Robin Kinstead. Uh, Robin was uh, a contemporary of mine at, at Moore College, just a couple of years ahead of me, and uh, he commences there in, at the end of January next year, which is good news. Uh, Robin's married to Sarah, and they have two children, Nathaniel and Rebecca. Uh, so please pray for the Kinsteads as they begin their ministry, uh, and continue also, I would say, to pray for those parishes that uh, continue to seek a, a, a pastor. Um, there's a number of them, including uh, St Michael's uh, Cathedral in Wollongong. So uh, let's remember those uh, those churches as they seek a, a, a rector, a senior pastor.
Uh, just finally, as we are about to come to, to prayer, uh, just to remember in your prayers, if you will, Betty Newman, she has been unwell. She's had a couple of heart attacks. Um, so please pray for her. And also, good news, Roger Summerall Jr. is now home. And so we've got to give thanks for that. So we're going to pray now and Peter is going to come and lead us in that. Thank you, Peter. Let us pray for all people and for the church throughout the world. Almighty and ever-living God, we are taught by your holy word to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all people. We ask you in, our, in your mercy to receive our prayers which we offer to, to your divine mercy. We pray that you will lead the nations of the world in the ways of righteousness and peace and guide their rulers in wisdom and justice for the tranquility and good of all. Bless especially your servant, Elizabeth, our Queen, her representatives and ministers, her parliaments, and all who exercise authority in this land. Grant that they may impartially administer justice, restrain wickedness and vice, and uphold integrity and truth. As the COVID-19 pandemic continues, we pray that you will have mercy. Heal those who are afflicted, strengthen the medical workers, and may the vaccination proceed quickly and fairly for all peoples and nations. And we ask you of your goodness, Lord, to comfort and sustain all who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. We pray for Barry and Sylvia Mahaffey and their family, for Roger Summerall Jr., Anne Summerall, Harvey McDuff, Patricia Noy, Betty Newman, Don Wilson and Bill Thorpe. We beseech you to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity and concord. And grant that all who confess your holy name may agree in the truth of your holy word and live in unity and godly love. Give grace, Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, especially the Archbishop of Sydney, Kanishka Raphael, the Bishop of Wollongong, Peter Hayward, our Senior Minister, Nigel Parker, our Children's Minister, Murray Border, that by their life and teaching they may set forth your true life-giving word and rightly and duly administer your holy sacraments. God of love, whose will it is that everyone should be saved, bless all who have gone to preach, to teach and to heal. We pray for Craig and Samantha McCorkendale in Cambodia, Amy Stevens in Argentina, and Roger and Amanda Kingdom in Newman, Western Australia. Guard, guide, and strengthen them. Raise up more people in your worldwide church to pray and to work, to care and to understand, to give to you and to go for you that your church may grow, your will be done, your kingdom come, and your glory be revealed. And to all your people, give your heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present. 
that they may receive your word with reverent and obedient hearts and serve you in holiness and righteousness all the days of their lives. And we also bless your holy name for all your servants who have died in the faith of Christ. Give us grace to follow their good examples that with them we may be partakers of your eternal kingdom. Grant this, Father, for Jesus Christ's sake, our only mediator and advocate, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. And together, we, Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Thank you, Peter. We, uh, we come now to uh, sharing together the Lord's Supper. And uh, so if you have your, uh, your uh, cups there, you can open those, which we will do now. And there'll be a bowl at the back of the hall for you to put these in when you, at the end of the service, thank you, the remains. Let me share these words with you. Whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So then, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Examine yourselves, and only then eat the bread and drink from the cup. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. And he also said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. At the heart of the Christian life is active trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrificial death for sin. In this symbolic meal originating from Jesus' last supper with his disciples, we express and strengthen our trust in him as we eat and drink with our brothers and sisters in Christ. The Lord's Supper is an outward and visible sign of the grace shown to us in the death of our Saviour. As we share bread and wine together, we're invited to feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. We are faced again with God's love for the unworthy and are strengthened by faith in the one whose body was given and whose blood was shed for us. Come then with heartfelt repentance and genuine trust in the Lord Jesus, recognising the significance of sharing in this way. And so together we do that with this, we begin with this prayer. We do not presume to come to your table, merciful Lord, trusting in our own righteousness, but in your boundless goodness and mercy. We are not worthy even to the crumbs from under your table, but you are the same Lord, always rich in mercy. Enable us by faith to eat the flesh of your dear Son, Jesus Christ, and to drink his blood, that we may be cleansed from sin, and forever dwell in him and he and us. Amen. Uh, so lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. 
You are worthy, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honour and power for you created all things and by your will they existed and were created. Therefore, with all those gathered around your throne in heaven, we lift our voices to praise you saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. We praise you especially for your Son, our Saviour Jesus Christ, who by his death on the cross and rising to new life offered the one true sacrifice for sin and obtained an eternal deliverance for his people. And we respond, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive praise and honour and glory and power forever and ever. We thank you, Father, that on the night before he died, Jesus took bread. And when he'd given you thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, after supper, he took the cup and again giving you thanks, he gave it to his disciples saying, drink from this, all of you, for this is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Therefore, Father, we thank you for these gifts of bread and wine and pray that we who eat and drink them in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, believing our Saviour's word, may be partakers of his body and blood. To Jesus, who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Come, let us eat and drink in remembrance that Christ died for us and feed on him in our hearts by faith with thanksgiving. And so we take the bread. Take and eat this in remembrance that Christ died for you and feed on him in your heart by faith with thanksgiving. So also we take the cup. Drink this in remembrance that Christ's blood was shed for you and be thankful. Lord and Heavenly Father, in your loving kindness, accept our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Grant that by the means and the merits and death of your Son, Jesus Christ, and through faith in his blood, we and your whole church may receive forgiveness of our sins and all other benefits of his passion. With gratitude for all your mercies, we offer ourselves to you as a living sacrifice through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And we respond, send us out in the power of your spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. And together, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, praise and glory, wisdom and thanks, honour, power and strength be to our God forever and ever. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord in the name of Christ. Amen. We're going to finish our service this morning. One last song. Uh, this is It Is Well With My Soul.
and 